Hi folks, job shop job. We've got to make this assembly jig for a customer. Relatively simple part with one exception, which is we've got this curved surface. So how do we go through making this reliably? It really comes down to work holding. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. So what I love about this is what we talked about in last week's Fusion Friday, which is using a really reliable, fast, and cheap way to make a custom fixture, and that's using our laser cutter. If you don't have a laser cutter, think about reaching out to a local school or makerspace. They're becoming more and more popular. We've had ours for about a month, and it's been insanely useful because we all love soft shells, but they cost money and they take time. Starting out with a relatively big piece of aluminum, big enough to where I want to try to not scrap parts. And what we realized was the best way to make this is to actually to make two in one. And that's something we'll sometimes do is reach out to our customer and say, hey, do you want to just have two of these for X price? Because uh, the reality is we've got to use this chunk of material anyways. What we did was we cut a trough through the center with a shear hog. On the Tormach 770, all of the RPMs that we've got, 10K, eight thousandths of an inch feed per tooth that's 80 inches per minute with our typical go-to recipe card here by the way to our recipe for the shear hog for various different machines 0.1 inch optimal load or width of cut and 0.2 inch max step down i will admit one of my takeaways from this video was starting to think about we sh we need to figure out ways to and i know you can't believe i'm going to say this successfully slot because the reality is just because adaptive is amazing doesn't mean it's the right thing all the time and this took 27 minutes. That's too long, I will admit that. We could have likely walked across this slotting, especially with a tool like the shear hog, where it's very difficult uh, to chip weld. So we will work on that. We will be back with a video and answers on that recipe. Decking off with the Superfly. Anybody notice something unusual about this Superfly toolpath? It doesn't actually do a standard linking move. Under edit linking, we turned off lead in, lead out because I didn't want it to do that transitional linking move on the part. I wanted it to look like a nice clean left to right motion. Drilling this out with a .386 drill. Ed had said, John, I had some problems uh, with speeds and fees. It didn't really run like I'd hoped. What do you think? So let's take a look. That recipe was 2970 RPMs and about .009 feed per rev. So card here to our speeds and feeds worksheet. I'm going to type in under this drilling section here, .386 and 0 0.009 just to show what Ed had and the feed was 2970, 2970, so that's too fast. Our comment here is for high-speed steel drills, run between 100 and 200 surface feet. So I'm gonna drop that RPM in half, 1500, and feed per rev, we don't have a comment on here, but really I shoot for about five thousandths of an inch feed per rev as a general rule. So that's relatively slow. The other thing I would note is when you start getting into lower RPMs on the Tormach, especially the 770 and the 440, or any of your other import machines or low powered machines, they don't always have great torque at lower RPMs. So if I had to run this, I would consider dropping it into low belt pretty quickly, run this and then move it back up to the high belt because I love running the 770 at 10,000 RPMs with most of my end mills. You've got to get the lower speed though for twist drills. Speaking of using all the RPMs, next up is some 2D adaptives to rough out these slots. We're using our go-to three flute end mill, only one thousandth of an inch feed per tooth. We could go faster, but I don't think you'd actually get uh, the actual speed because it's such a small move. And that goes back to the same question about when we shear hog out this larger slot, which is, Adaptive isn't always the right answer, so it's on our plate to go look at how can we improve this time, but maintain tool life, maintain process reliability. I don't want to chip weld because we slotted, but I still, I know there's a better way to do this slot. So that's on our list to do, to go figure that out. One pro tip, if you are going to keep an adaptive with a really tight feed move like this, make sure under passes you have smoothing checked. Here I only have it at one thousandth of an inch per tooth, 
It's the same as my tolerance. Usually it's a good idea to have smoothing slightly larger, but nevertheless, take a look. I duplicated that toolpath. I turned the smoothing off. And if we look at the representation of the toolpath with show points, we have numerous black points. Those are additional lines of G-code. They are going to slow your machine down because it has to do additional feed moves and you don't see that represented in the estimated cycle time. So that's an example where your machine is gonna perform better even though the cycle time doesn't show it. By the way, see how I've got that preview of the time? Go up to your name, preferences, cam, show operation machine time. Thank you, Autodesk. I've been asking for this for a while. It's great to see it in there. It is still pretty cool to see the machine dance like that. I mean, it is really cooking with those small moves. 2D Adaptive, this time with a 3 8 inch end mill. We're actually still using almost all of our RPMs, We're running at 9,176, one thousandth of an inch feed per tooth. I am cautious as I step up to the larger diameter tools to make sure uh, the increased tool pressure doesn't cause chatter, because chatter is never okay. And we're stepping down here at one times diameter, leaving some radial stock. We'll come back then afterward and clean those holes up. It's interesting, before I would have considered using the boring operation, but we have found uh, we've kind of gotten away from that because it tends to put more wear on the leading edge of the tool, and aluminum isn't that big a deal, but on some of our steel parts, we're fine. We were giving premature, or what I thought was premature tool wear, uh, so instead we're stepping down with this style of an adaptive where we're actually able able to use more of the carbide that we purchase. What I like about this too is you see the chips evacuate. That's why it's worth pre-drilling it. It's so much easier on what I think is an expensive 3 8 inch tool and we're promoting chip evacuation because that's what kills tools. When you recut those chips, you're doubling or tripling uh, or worse your chip load and the carbide just doesn't like it. You'll get micro cracks or real fractures. Then finally, that same tool to come around to do a single full depth of cut cleanup pass. I think this looks great. By the way, we're using our mod vise. We absolutely love using it. Uh, it's great for this where we want to hold on with relatively thin parts, but have the flexibility to hold different size stock. And sometimes you've got a ton of Y travel on your machine, but vices don't always make it to hold that. Notice we're choking up on this tool as much as possible. Not the best for uh, the viewer pleasure of seeing that tool, but I absolutely insist you choke up as much as possible to maximize rigidity. And finally, some machined chamfers. 4,000 RPMs, 3 thousandths of an inch feed per tooth to put on a 10 thou chamfer. Make use of that chamfer tip offset. That way, as you walk around that part, you're cutting with a better area of the tool, and sometimes it's worth even varying that just so you wear the tool more evenly, or if you've got a small chip on a chamfer tool, you can just shift it up and get some more life out of it. Next up, bandsaw. So we're gonna cut this in half. This was again going back to how do we maximize the material usage. It doesn't really do me any good to keep this drop around if we hadn't machined the part. And a lot of times your customer will say, hey, yeah, I wouldn't mind having an extra piece for you know a small amount or some amount of additional revenue. Pull out our part, drop in a scrap piece or drop piece from an old job. We do find that decking it helps with the super glue trick. If you haven't seen that card here to our video on that. So we're opening up some bores here and we're gonna use gauge pins to locate the part. Um, this is a way of increasing sort of a force multiplier of the power of the super glue trick. We've had some folks ask, can we use the super glue on steel or on even stainless steel? I don't have a good answer for you with empirical data. I can tell you that the strength with which it holds on is pretty amazing. And I don't think there's any reason why steel or stainless should weaken that because it's really the tape that's providing the pork holding power. But we're gonna do some testing and we'll get back to you on it. Ed did a great job, set up your Z with the tape to accommodate for that Z height. And I think Ed ended up being within half a thousandth of an inch on correct Z height, which is awesome. We're walking around the outside of this part first with the shear hog. So you really don't want to take a tool like the Superfly and have it end up tearing material off because that material overhangs and is unsupported. We're still cooking though, same recipe as before, which is 10K RPMs at 80 inches per minute. The pins gave us really good locating, but I'm sure they also increase the stability and work holding power of the super glue. Quick deck with the Superfly. It's actually pretty tricky to hold tighter than a thou with the Superfly. You just have to really be paying attention to how you measure your offset and checking it and do some tests. I find if it's critical, I like to walk it in. 
uh, because it's a polished insert with a really positive rake on a material like aluminum you can take really light axial depths of cut you know a thou or even less and it still forms a chip it tends not to rub Tool 31 to do the same adaptive for that slot on the back side. So that's one of the features that was critical was to maintain accuracy of locating the slot on each side and having them be located correctly relative to each other even after we flipped it. laser time so again this is what's so cool again we walked through it in the fusion friday ed was super happy with the accuracy we were able to get uh, inside of one thousandth of an inch we cut a couple of test pieces uh, we ended up not using the box shape design that i had in my original fusion friday but rather just measuring the dimension from the outside to the inside edge right there to just to confirm that we liked the sizing of the acrylic fixture which is important because again our work coordinate system is actually on the acrylic laser cut guide with the x being this face the z being this face because if you look at it you don't have a really natural or, or easy to access xz otherwise and then the y being the inside face of the part which is against our hard jaw and coplanar with the outside of the acrylic <music> And finally, one last operation, just a quick setup to do a backside hole as well as some chamfering. I give Ed a lot of credit. He didn't rely just on the square, but rather used a square to get it approximately dialed in. Then we grabbed the dial test indicator to sweep across the part. And this is such a great way to make really accurate parts is just use the tools at your disposal. Having these indicators with a good mag base, we like the Noga ones around your machine means you're more likely to grab it, set it up, sweep that part across, tap that dead blow in, and make a part absolutely perfect. Drilling that out with a quarter inch or about 6.3 millimeter twist drill, 300 surface speed. Again, I would drop that in half to about 150 surface speed uh, for feet per minute, but we're good on the feed per red here of five thousandths of an inch. With drilling, listen to the machine. If you hear it's bogging down, you're gonna have to either increase the torque, which may mean increasing or decreasing the RPMs, or decrease the feed per rev. Changing your pec depth, if I find, doesn't really fix that problem. It can help with minor adjustments, but really it's gonna be your RPMs or your feed rate. For me, the takeaways are fixturing. The super glue trick has just been absolutely game changing for so many of the parts that we make, including like last week's Wednesday widget with the Arduino door, but also the ability to make quick templates and jigs with a laser cutter. Uh, our boss laser, 100 watt CO2, was about $13,000 delivered. You can get a laser for like a quarter of that price, dubious quality, and, and it may not last, or better off, try to find one locally. More and more maker spaces are popping up, and being able to cut a jig like this for pennies worth of plastic is an awesome way. I'm uh, already thinking of a few projects where we're going to use it again, both for one-offs, but also as repeat fixtures and setup jigs. Hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you next Wednesday.